Welcome to another episode of the Chefs and Guests Podcast on the Spoon Mob Podcast feed. My name is Ray. I'm your host as always. Uh, I haven't done one of these in a while. This is going to be, or at least released one of these in a while. Uh, this is the 13th Chefs and Guests episode that we've done, and it's a little different. Uh, this time we actually had a sommelier on. Um, we actually have, with this episode, advanced sommelier Gregory Stokes. I just call him Greg. You can find him at Veritas, uh, also in the process of opening up a wine store downtown, which is actually, so if you know where Veritas is, kind of at the corner of Gay and High there, um, there's also Brioso Coffee, and then there's the main entrance to the Citizens Trust uh, cocktail bar, and right next to the Citizen Trust cocktail bar entrance is where Accent Wine is going to be, and they're going to open up here, uh, I believe in June, uh, Greg said, when he was doing the podcast here, and we were talking about it, but Really interesting conversation. I wanted to get some sommeliers on the podcast for a little while just because I'm such a big fan of wine and especially champagne. So um, you get a few recommendations from them, too, as well, kind of towards the end. But we cover, you know, how Greg got into wine, um, you know, working at different restaurants, his career coming up, you know, the process of, you know, basically becoming an advanced sommelier and, and going through the process of trying to become a master sommelier and and doing the different, you know, tastings and not having a whole bunch of wine professionals around, you know, when he's coming up. So he had to drive, you know, all over the place up to Cleveland and up to Cincinnati. Then he's working dinner service and, and all this stuff. So it's really, it's really interesting to hear firsthand, like a sommelier talk about just how demanding it is when I think people maybe, people maybe don't understand exactly everything that goes into it. It's essentially like getting, you know, your law degree uh, to get the master sommelier, you know, certain certification um there too so it's not um it's not for like the faint of heart it's not you know you, there's a lot of people uh, in upcoming episodes that we talked to that you know started with it and then decided you know they didn't want to go any further or, or shifted kind of focus and stuff like that so you know it's a big accomplishment that greg's you know at the advanced level and, and he's going for the master um so i really you know hope he gets it he's, he's getting ready to kind of ramp up on the the studying and, and starting to do all this stuff again. And he explains kind of all that. And we talk about, you know, wine and champagne and, you know, why people don't drink it more, you know, the, and marketing stuff with that and, and everything. So it's a really good conversation. You know, we talk about accent too, kind of the vision behind that, how that kind of, you know, evolved and, you know, it's him and, and Josh Dalton, who's the owner of Veritas, you know, they kind of partnered up on this venture. So um, it's set to open. It's going to be really cool. Uh, we don't really have anything like it here in Columbus. I mean, we have Wine on High, uh, which is a store, but and then you have like 1837 out kind of in the New Albany area, which is a little bit more of like a, a liquor store kind of wine emporium. But kind of what they're doing, you know, we don't have any big box retailers, but apparently like Wine.com is opening a warehouse here. So we don't have something like a Jungle Gyms or like a Cork Dorks in Nashville, Jungle Gyms in Cincinnati. These, you know, big retail shops that have just, you know, cases and cases of the same wine, but also have, you know, a couple hundred different bottles in their store. Like we don't have that here in Columbus. We used to uh, with the Andersons and we kind of talk about that, but that kind of wound up um, just closing. They had like four locations, uh, a couple in Columbus, like one was up in BG, but they closed a couple years ago and, and that's it. So, you know, Columbus with being so big, probably going to eventually wind up getting like a big box, but it's tough because the landscape's changed, you know, too, with that, with having, you need the retail space for that and everything. So really interesting conversation with Greg, really appreciate him coming on, kind of being the, the guinea pig for the, the sommelier um, interviews that we're doing here. So there's a bunch coming out, you know, I know we haven't released a chefs and guests episode in about a month or so. Um, that's not because we weren't recording them or anything like that. There was a vacation in there, but there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that I can't quite talk about yet. That's going to come to light over the course of June here. Um, but we got a nice run of like six, seven chefs and guest episodes here in a row. So every Thursday is going to be coming out. So i um, really proud of them, really happy with, you know, how they're coming out. I actually have an editor now, so I'm not doing this anymore. Uh, so Andrew uh, is our editor and he's going to be, cleaning all these up and making them sound as pristine as possible um, for your listening ears. So he's also going to go back and, and master uh, the ones that have already come out. So if there's something that you haven't listened to as well, or you were listening to or, or something like that, and maybe didn't finish, um, those are going to be kind of 
the, the content's not going to change. They're just going to sound better. Um, you know, and we've been adding stuff and, and doing stuff. So there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. Website's going to get a little touch up too as well and, and everything. So it'll be kind of a, a rollout, you know, over the course of the next month or two here, but really excited with the stuff that we're doing. Bunch of ideas kind of in the hopper. So, um, but this is, like I said, the 13th, uh, chefs and guests episode we've done first sommelier. Um, too as well. So Greg agreed to be, like I said, our guinea pig. He's uh, just like Jay Clevin was the guinea pig for the chefs and guests. Um, you know, Greg's the the guinea pig here, but can't you know can't appreciate it enough. Uh, it's always great to you know go to Veritas, see Greg, and and chat a little bit real quick about wine and you know what he recommends drinking and stuff like that too. So uh, when you're in there at the restaurant, but um, without further ado. Interview here with Greg Stokes, Vance Sommelier over at Accent and Veritas. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on and, and doing the podcast and agreeing to come on. Appreciate you taking out some time. Um, you're the first sommelier I've had on the podcast thus far. So you can you know put that feather in your, in your cap if you want. Um, <laughs> it's up to you. But, but, you know, kind of start where we usually do with everybody. So... I did some research and working on kind of, you know, we'll have a section of the website for sommeliers too as well on there. But, you know, you originally got into it, I think, from you were going to law school, right? And then you wound up taking like an intro SOM class, kind of not by accident, but you didn't really know what it was. Yeah. So I was supposed to go to law. I, I never attended law school. Oh, okay. That was my game plan when I was going to school. Um, and I got this philosophy degree. And then when I got out, I was like, man, you know what? Law school is not a good idea for me. Yeah, I was working in restaurants and I started working at this this wine bar. And uh, it was just had this overwhelming selection of wines. Like, I don't know what any of these are. And so a buddy of mine is like, hey, there's this wine class that you could go take. And I was like, well, that sounds pretty good. So uh, it was the introductory sommelier course uh, from the quartermaster sommeliers. And, and so I took it and it was just like mind blowing. It was amazing. And although it was really funny, cause I remember on the second day, like everyone during lunch is sort of like madly studying, cramming flashcards. So I was like, well, what are you guys doing? And they're like, Oh, well, there's this, uh, there's the exam at the end of it. This was, this wasn't all fun. It was actually a test. I was like, Oh, good to know. But um, fortunately um, I passed and kind of off to the races since then. Like I was like, this is amazing, and I want to just keep learning. Was that te- was that just like a two day class, or was it like multiple weeks, or how was that yeah. set up? Yeah, it's set up. It's two days. So, um, the way they sell it actually is it's actually two days of review. Plus, then they also teach you the basics of their blind tasting method. And then that's supposed to set you up for like, here's our expectation for the certified exam. So then then you basically self-study. And then whenever you think it, you're ready, you go and take their examination. And so I did the certified exam, I think, three months after the introductory course. Oh, okay. That's pretty quick. Yeah. And then you're cur- currently advanced, right? That's correct. Yeah. I passed uh, the advanced exam in 2017 um, with uh, my first try, which was which was pretty, pretty great. And then uh, after that, sitting for the, the master. So I passed the theory examination of the master exam in uh, 2019. And there's three parts to that, right? There's the theory. Is it like the education and then the blind tasting? Yeah, so theory is basically the whole world of wine. So what's the what's the soil type in in this vineyard, and uh, what are the laws here or there? Then there's the tasting, which is the one that everyone talks about, and then there's also a service examination, which is they basically just sort of create the uh, the restaurant from hell that's on fire, and then see how much dignity and grace you have. So you, can you do the, like those three? Do you have to do them all in the same weekend when you go or can you do them in different parts? And it's like, if you pass one part, you have, you know, the clock is ticking and, and it'll be good for 12 months. And in that time frame, you have to pass the other two or how does that kind of work? Yeah, so there there is a clock. Um, they only offer each part of the examination once a year. So, yeah, I mean, you can definitely do it all in one week. Um they uh, nowadays they've they've changed the rules and you have to pass theory before you're allowed to sit for the other parts. 
So when I passed in 2019, my only goal that year was to pass theory because if you can't get over the hurdle, it doesn't matter. And so now, um, yeah, once you pass theory, you have three calendar years. So you basically have three tries to pass the other two parts. And if you don't, then you reset and you have to take theory again. Okay. So basically, so for most people, it's probably you have a three-year window. And then after that, if they don't get it, they probably are just like, because it's super stressful, right? There's a lot of time that goes into it with studying. I mean, I mean, I think like the the figures on the master sommelier examination, which it's an invitation only examination. So if they think you're ready, they'll invite you. And then um, I think no matter how, like total pass rate, if you've without factoring in the number of times that you've tried to take it, the total pass rate is like 4%. So it's, it is pretty difficult um, and it is really stressful and yeah. So like resetting is like the worst thing ever because you have to go back to theory and it's, you know, it's like you're stu- it's almost a, a second job. I mean, you're studying four hours a day every day. And so if I pulled these numbers uh, the other day, so they, they're really from like the Court of Master Somalia website. So they should be fairly accurate. But they said as of basically the other day, there's 172 master psalms in the American chapter. 144 are men, 28 are women and like 269 worldwide. So you're looking at. You're not, you, there's not even 300 people in the world that have like the designation just to kind of put that in context for people that are listening. Like, it's not something that you just decide on a whim that you're going to go, like, it's a concentrated thing. Like it's, would you equate it to, I mean, I know you didn't go to law school, but would you equate it almost to like passing the bar essentially? Yeah. In some sense, I think you could definitely, you know, the amount of stress that people go under to, to try to pass the bar. Um, yeah, I think you could definitely equate it. It's funny. I mean, I've, I have a friend who's a um, periodontic surgeon and he felt like the certified was actually almost as difficult as some of his medical exams. But that's just, I think, you know, you're good at whatever you're good at. So like for me, like I'm very happy that I've never had to take a medical exam because I think that's far harder than what we do as SANS. But here we are. So getting kind of going backwards just a touch, so you don't wind up going to law school. Then you, how did you wind up working at that wine bar? Like, how did you start getting into restaurants? Was that something that you just did in high school? It's just kind of like your first job experience or how did all that kind of start? Yeah. So it was kind of like a weird um, transition. So my high school job and summer job in college was actually as an arborist. So um, I worked with trees and so then um, when I graduated from college, I ended up getting a second job as a, as a restaurant server somewhere. And I was like, oh, you know, this wine thing is pretty cool. And when I was trying to figure out, I was like, well, what should I do with my life? Um, I was like, well, I like working with plants and this wine thing seems pretty cool. So maybe I should be a winemaker. So I started exploring the, the world of wine because I figured, you know, you can't be a responsible winemaker if you don't, you know, understand what great wine is and what isn't. And so I kind of, I ended up applying for this, this wine bar um, just because I figured that would be like a really good exposure. Eventually I learned enough about the wine industry to realize that I would never be a winemaker and had no desire to, because as they say, the best way to, uh, to make a million dollars in, uh, in the wine industry is to start with 10. Yeah. And it's all going, it's, I mean, a lot of it, at least in like Napa is going through consolidation where there's big, distributors that are just kind of buying up all the different wineries essentially they're buying up different you know groups and labels and stuff like that and so i mean that's i guess one way you can make money but yeah i mean because it takes a couple years before you're even able to put out any sort of wine if you're not taking over like an already existing you know vineyard and property that's already going absolutely that was actually my consideration i was like well i'm never going to buy somebody's vineyard so I'd have to start from scratch. And so you figure, you know, if you plant it takes three years to get usable fruit, if you want to make a red wine, you got to age it for a couple of years. So you're looking at like five years of negative cash outflow before you make your first penny back. And I was just like, that's, um, Seems uh, stressful. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I had a, a pretty fortunate childhood, but, uh, we weren't made of money. And so I was just like, well, I don't have that. So, you know what, I'll just go with selling wine, which is, a lot of fun and a lot less stressful. Now you actually worked at one point as like a wine sales rep, right? 
I did. Yeah. I worked for a small um, regional importer and distributor. Was that being a wine sales rep? How is that set up? Like, is it like other industries where you have a certain territory or is it just, you know, go and establish accounts wherever? Was it, you know, did you have to do like a lot of traveling across the state or were you just based in Columbus or? I was primarily based in Columbus, but I did do uh, some other stuff where I had to like drive back and forth to Cincinnati sometimes. And then uh, we were trying to establish some relationships with distributors in other states for our import goods. So then I would travel to to like uh, Kentucky uh, and West Virginia and Indiana to to work with with those distributors. Um, but mostly I spent my time selling to restaurants and retailers in the Columbus area. And then I think, is it from after that, did you wind up at uh, taking over as like bar manager at Till Dynamic Fair? Was that after? So Till was actually before um, for the distributor. So I'd been working at the wine bar. I got my certified um, uh, sommelier. And so that was like, okay, I wanted to pursue that as a career. And I remember looking at this job post for being the sommelier at Alinea and sort of their criteria. And they were like, okay, we want an advanced SOM who's had at least two years of restaurant management experience. And so then I was like, all right. So I set my goal to be a restaurant manager. And so I ended up working at um, Till's predecessor, Dragonfly Neo V, which was a sort of this um, lauded vegan restaurant uh, in uh, Victorian Village in Columbus. And when I got hired there, they're like, hey, so we're actually closing in three months and we're going to reconcept into this omnivorous concept called Till. Uh, do you want to, to be the manager for it? And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, so that was a big uh, learning curve. It was a lot less to do with wine and more to do with um, like craft cocktails. So that was sort of that year that we opened was sort of the very beginning of the craft cocktail phase in Columbus. So we had a lot of, or I had a lot of fun, you know, learning how to make bitters, make your own vermouth, make your own tonic um, and go through that whole process. Then I worked, ended up after two years of till, then I decided it was like, well, I really want to get back into wine and we're not doing a lot of wine here. So that was when I worked, ended up getting a job for the distributor. And then, so I worked for them for three years and then I decided I I took the advanced exam and passed. um, And I passed with, uh, I got the, what's called the Rudd scholarship. So basically the top score of the exam, they give you a a scholarship, but more importantly, they fast track you on the MS, uh, like to get your invitation and immediately start testing for it. And I had Pat, I got the top score in my examination. So I got fast tracked on the master program. So at that point I was like, Oh man, I got to really get back on the floor. And so that's when I uh, came on board with uh, Veritas. For those that don't know, Till Dynamic, uh, like you said, the predecessor was Dragonfly. Uh, the chef, I think, was Magdiel uh, Womark. And he had, he'd been nominated for like a James Beer Award for like two years. I think it was like 2010, 2011. And then they yeah. did the reconcept. And that was, like you said, like right before. Because I mean, you guys were super early on doing just like, you know, sourcing kind of locally for cocktails and, and doing all that kind of crazy stuff that now is kind of commonplace with. I don't know what you would call excessively curated cocktails. Like, I I don't know what you would exactly label it necessarily now, but you guys were on like the cutting edge of it before it became kind of mainstream, right? Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, the chef was maniacal when it came to, to sourcing. So there was a farm in Kentucky that made, uh, or that grew, um, cows that were, it was a biodynamic farm. And he was like, this is the only beef that I'll ever serve. And so he would drive his car down there like every few weeks and pick up this beef from this one farm. Like that was kind of like how maniacal he was about um, ingredients and sourcing. And so I tried to kind of take that ethos and put that into the bar program. So like I remember we did one cocktail where we took some local spirits and 
made that into bitters. Then we took a local Ohio winery and some local spirits and made the vermouth. And then we actually had a cherry tree in the garden behind the restaurant. So I made those into maraschino cherries. And so we did like a, an all Columbus sourced um, uh, Manhattan. So that was kind of just like playing around with ideas like that. I'm trying to remember when was that? It would probably be like in 2014, 2015. Probably, yeah. And then so when you started at, at Veritas, Veritas was still up in Delaware when you started with them, right? Um, actually, yeah, no, shoot. It was probably like 2012. But yeah, anyway, uh, I had been selling to Veritas actually as a wine rep. And so then when I passed the uh, the advanced exam, um, I was talking to um, Josh Dalton, the, the chef and the owner. Um, and he was talking about how he really needed a sommelier. He was going to be moving the restaurant down to Columbus. And, and he was like, man, I don't know how I'm going to pay for a, a sommelier and a manager. And I was like, well, don't have the sommelier be the manager. He's like, well, where am I going to find that? And I was like, I'll do it for you. It was like, ah, good thing I put so much on my plate. This has been great for the last few years. <laughs> Kept me busy for sure. So did you, like when you took over kind of as, cause I mean, you're, you're still based, you're, I mean, what's your title now? The beverage director, general manager. I mean, you, you do a whole bunch of stuff there. I mean. Yeah. And so in the sommelier community, we jokingly call it the sommager, uh, because the industry, the restaurant industry in general has changed so much. And there are very, very few restaurants that can pay for people to be dedicated sommeliers. So yeah, at this point you wear a lot of hats. Uh, so I am the, I am the 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 front of the house uh, manager, uh, sommelier, uh, wine director. I guess um, we are opening a few more restaurants. So uh, when the that all happens, like I'll be taking over all the wine programs, and so then I'll be the sort of the wine director for the company. Do the Beer and liquor programs, will those fall under that too as well? Or is that going to be a separate thing where you don't, you just focus kind of on wine? Uh, or do you not know yet? <laughs> no, I mean, so we've got some amazing uh, bar managers. Um, I mean, I can do, I've done the, the cocktail thing, but when I started interviewing with Josh, I, I was like, you know what, I don't really want to do it. I want to kind of focus on wine. So, I, I mean, I really... In, joy the our bar managers they're incredibly creative people and i'll i'll go in and maybe sometimes um you like taste a drink and like you know what maybe adjust the balance but otherwise like i let them just or they have total creative freedom to kind of do their own thing beer program josh and i are usually just uh, he and i both really enjoy beer so he and i'll just kind of like pick beers together um but beer has never been um, a big mover for us. I mean, I think like old Veritas up in Delaware, I would say that 85% of alcohol revenue came from liquor. And then uh, once we moved downtown Columbus and I took over the wine program, I would say that like probably 80% of the alcohol revenues now are through the wine program and maybe like 1% is beer. So how do you decide then what makes it onto, you know, either into the cellar or into, you know, the pairing for a specific menu. I mean, obviously you go through and taste and everything, but, but when a new rep or somebody, since you used to be a rep approaches you, how is that whole dynamic? Is it people that you've already know because you've kind of like run across paths or is it somebody new and it's like, okay. And you're, it's, is there some sort of like sales dance that you guys are doing or is it just pretty chill and just try this if you like it, like cool or, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, because I have been a wine rep, I try to make uh, my my sales reps lives easy in that um, I try to be very transparent, but it, I also know I am kind of this difficult account because I think like a lot of restaurants, it's, you know, once you write the wine list, like that's the, that's the list for six months or a year or even more. And uh, since I kind of have ADD, like there's just so many killer wines across the world. Like we change the list all the time, especially with the pairings that changes every week because the dishes change every week. So the wine reps, it's more of just like, I just tell them, it's like, 
if you're really excited about it, bring it in, let's try it. And then I just kind of have a mental Rolodex of like, all right, this is the perfect dish for that wine that I had six months ago. And now we'll bring it in. Uh, so, I mean, we don't have, I know most of the reps that work in Columbus just because it's a small industry. Um, and I work with most of the companies that, um, that sell here just because again, it's just trying to, I mean, in my experience, because there's so many great wines all over the world, there's no way to highlight all of them at once. So I just try to keep the program flowing just to keep exposing people to new, exciting regions and areas. And, and the reps have been really great to just kind of show me everything that they have. Is it more about taste and profile when you're bringing something in? Or is there like a specific region or that you find yourself kind of gravitating towards a little bit more when you go back and look and you look in the cellar and you're like, yeah, we have a lot of stuff from this area. Like, or- yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, like we'll always have a lot of champagne because I think that was actually the first conversation that Josh and I ever had was how much we both love champagne. Um, so, I mean, we have a lot of that. Uh, there's a lot of burgundy, um, I mean, we just did the French menu. So that was an all French wine list. So that obviously had a lot of Burgundy, but, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, there are definitely regions that I like to kind of show off to people or, or really kind of shine a light. I mean, so I think that people don't drink enough Australian wine. Uh, I love uh, or South African wine. There's cool stuff like Chateau Moussard from Lebanon. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do find I'm probably more of a Europhile when it comes to things like, you know, yeah, like Sonoma Coast Pinot Noirs are, are delicious and we'll always have them because they're great. But I would also really love to get people excited about German Pinot Noirs, for instance. So it's more of, I guess, trying to, you know, I think our wine cellar is really split between like the familiar and the comfortable and then just the things that people probably have no reference for. Because, you know, some people want to be able to walk into a, a restaurant and and have a bottle they're familiar with and comfortable with. And some people want to feel excited and explore. And so I try to do both. Yeah. I mean, Columbus is probably still a majority, a beer town, uh, at least probably even craft beer, but I mean, Ohio as a state is definitely your domestic beers probably. And then if you even start to get into wine, it's probably mostly Napa cab probably for Columbus. So with that being said, do you think, since you've started with Veritas and, and seen kind of progression of, you know, the restaurant industry is, is evolving. Um, better and better restaurants are coming in. Different people are moving here. Do you think the city's drinking habits are starting to shift away from beer and move towards other beverages, like maybe closer towards wine? Or do you think they're moving in a different direction towards like alcohol seltzers, which are kind of the new thing? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, Ohio definitely is a is a big beer market. Like, I think uh, there's this bar up in uh, Putin Bay that's only open seasonally, and it's the largest Miller account in the country. Uh, I mean, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of beer here, but you know, I think there's also a lot of wine drinkers. Um, you're right that at least in Columbus. Uh, especially out in the suburbs, there's a skew towards um, Napa Cabernet. Um, Cincinnati and Cleveland, I feel like do a little bit more um, like Burgundy Bordeaux. But, um, you know, I think if if you do look at the demographics, um, wine is actually, the United States is still the largest uh, importer of wine in the world we buy a ton of wine. And so I think that, you know, the demographics in Ohio are shifting a little bit. Like there are a lot of people moving here from, from New York, Chicago, San Francisco, um, who um, definitely have a, a preference towards wine. But I think there's also a, a sense of, you know, I think that, and I love beer. Like when I'm at home, I always, I, I drink a lot of beer but I think there always has been a slight difficulty for beer to break into the fine dining segment. Like if we're going to talk about restaurants, I mean, most people, if you're going to go to a fine dining restaurant, they'll drink cocktails or wine. So I think in a fine dining segment, it's much more about like, what's your split between cocktail drinkers and, and wine drinkers. 
And we've been, we're in a pretty unique situation again, since we're a tasting menu restaurant. Um, we have a lot of, our guests are great and, uh, they really are willing to place themselves in our hands. So like I always joke around with the wine reps, um, and is that we'll sell more crew Beaujolais than we do Napa Cabernet. Not that like Napa Cabernet isn't great, but given the way that Josh cooks, there's not really a lot of dishes that pair great that he cooks, uh, with cab. So, um, I think that, you know, we have a really great clientele who's just really excited to, to learn about wine. And, and I think that wine is just going to keep growing. Um, I think, you know, like millennials now, I think dollar for dollar spend more money on wine than baby boomers do at this point. Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, I fall into the millennial group and I couldn't tell you because most of the people that I know, like they, they can't, I don't know if it's just, they're afraid of going to the next level, but a lot of them are, they won't spend like more than 20 bucks on like a bottle of wine. And I think it's, I forget what the percentage is, but a majority of wines that are sold at like a Costco or something like that are, are under $20. And, and so that's always something the, the one guy from like Shark Tank always like mentions whenever there's like a wine thing on there. I don't know how accurate that is. I know he's somewhat involved in the wine uh, industry, O'Leary there, but. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. I mean, even just if you look at, like, even at restaurants, I mean, your your volume movers are going to be glass pours, which are probably going to be priced at a retail value of under $20. And that's going to sell a lot more than your $100 Napa cabs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there is a price point, but yeah, the volume that goes out at, you know, $15 retail is, is pretty huge. So have you ever, you know, I know China's like a big or becoming a very big wine market. Have you ever run up against anyone, either a SOM, beverage director, rep that procuring for China at all? Or is that something that you just haven't encountered yet because of Columbus and its proximity? Yeah, I met a guy who actually used to run a wine importer in in China and then had, had moved back here. Um, so, I mean, you do see a little bit of it, but... Most of most of that, I mean, will stay over in Asia just from a logistics perspective. You're much like more likely to direct import from France to China than you are to import to the United States and then over to Fran- over to China. Yeah, yeah, I know that's a. I was just I was wondering that the other day. I know that's a random ass question. <laughs> yeah, I mean the Chinese market, it, it's crazy and it's it's becoming more uncertain. Um, I mean, I know like it, they famously drived up all the prices in Bordeaux, but it seems like they're kind of moving off of Bordeaux. And now that's what, like they're helping drive the prices up in Burgundy, which, you know, really don't need to be any higher than they already are. But here we are. And uh, but it'll be interesting to see what the Chinese Communist Party does, because I know that they're cracking down on the use of party funds on luxury goods, a.k.a. wine. And they're really trying to push the consumers there to buy domestic Chinese wine. So it'll be interesting to see the future of that country for imported goods. So when like the pandemic hit, a lot of restaurants started selling off their wine cellars just to basically be able to raise cash for whether it was employee funds or keep the restaurant afloat a little bit longer or or whatever. Uh, You guys wound up starting Cuvée Wine Society, which was basically uh, online sales, local delivery. What was the biggest challenge with with doing that? Did the idea stem from seeing other restaurants do it? Or was that something that you were already like, as soon as it happened, you were like, this is an avenue that we could, you know, financially have some money, you know, if we started doing this? Yeah, it was all kind of like a very organic thing. I mean, I remember... Um, it was it was March fifteenth, twenty twenty, is when the governor of Ohio ordered restaurants closed, and it was really had been like the whole week leading up to that was it was already starting to feel scary. You know, the Arnold Classic had just been canceled, and I remember like March fourteenth, which was a Saturday night. It was just like we were absolutely dead and empty, and we're like, man, this is this is nuts. And so I remember sitting. Uh, Watching uh, the two o'clock, I think it was two o'clock um, governor's conference when DeWine shut uh, all the restaurants down by executive order. And I had been, you know, drinking. And so I was, I was kind of buzzed <laughs> when, uh, when it happened because I was like, oh, man, here it comes. 
And then, so as soon as he gave the order, then I remember just like getting up from the couch and walking over to my computer and started programming the first rudimentary version of the website. And we, and I liquidated the whole Veritas wine cellar in I think like two weeks. Oh, wow. And then after that, it was like super uncertain as to what was going to happen. Um, and at that point, there was no government stimulus. So um, we started, I just kept, I was like, all right, well, we sold everything. So I'll just keep bringing stuff in and keep selling it. Um, so that way we could just build as big of a, a cash nest as we needed. So that when the staff was like, hey, I can't make rent now. because, And they're like, all right, great here's money to, to pay your bills. Um, now eventually like the, uh, you know, obviously the stimulus stuff came through and we didn't have to do that as much, but we ended up, yeah. I mean, it morphed into just being this bigger thing and we sold a ton of wine. And so that gave us, I think a, a helpful cash cushion so that when we did reopen, um, I mean, we're still only open three days a week and we're doing probably half the covers on those days that we used to. So um, every little bit of cash helps. So um, I'm glad that we, that we were able to do that. Is it fair to say that because of the success of Cuvée Wine Society that gave you guys the idea for Accent or was Accent something that was already, you and Josh kind of had already started planning before COVID happened? Yeah, no, it was totally organic from the, from the Cuvée Wine Society thing. Um, I remember as a wine rep, always saying to people, I was like, there is nothing less in this world that I want to do than work in wine retail. Because I just like the whole idea of like just standing there waiting for people to come in. It just seems so boring to me. Like I, I have to be like busy and running around. And so I didn't like, but yeah, after, I mean, the, the huge success of that wine delivery, um, then when a space became available, um, at um in the same building as Veritas, we were just like, all right, well, you we might as well keep keep a good thing going and see what happens. So yeah, then so that's accent is our brick and mortar. Um, which Cuvée Wine Society, like as a as a website, will cease to exist as soon as accent opens and everything will flow over to accent.wine as the URL. And that and so yeah, we'll continue with that with that wine delivery model, but with all the with some more um, in-person stuff as things uh, let up from all the COVID restrictions. Was well, also part of it, like Columbus doesn't really have a go-to wine shop. I mean, you have wine on high a little bit farther down the road in the short North area, but I feel like they mostly, I mean, they do have kind of what I would call like a high-end section, like maybe $50 or above, but a lot of their bottles I think are probably 40 or less. And there's like 1837 wine and spirits that's way out in Gahanna. But aside from kind of you, and I don't know if the refractory does any sort of retail stuff, there really isn't kind of a go-to wine shop in Columbus. I mean, there's nothing, there's no emporiums really or anything like that either. You have to go to like Cincinnati for that. So did, looking at kind of the, the wine landscape, did that give you kind of more comfort? Like, yeah, this is going to work or has a higher chance of, of working because there's kind of this void in there? Um. I look at it in a different way. I actually think that Columbus is as a market blessed with a lot of independent retailers. And I think it's more of like, so like every neighborhood has its own go-to shop. So like German village uh, has house Frau Haven. And I think Faye does a fantastic job. You've got a couple of wine shops in Grandview servicing that area, you know, Meza up in Westerville, although I don't think she's doing uh, brick, like brick and mortar sales anymore. I think she's gone a hundred percent to online sales. But I think like to that point, um, we don't have big box stores like um, Total Wines, which is actually great for great for these small independent businesses. So, yeah, I just felt like, you know, Columbus needed a like downtown Columbus as a neighborhood needed um, an independent um, shop that had a had a wide variety, a good selection. And I think what Columbus perhaps doesn't have as much is, and that's really what we're hoping to focus on, is uh, consumer education. Like there's not a place in Columbus where you can go and, uh, 
and just, you know, take a class and like teach me about this wine region. Um, and I think that's really what our niche is going to be. I mean, yeah, we're going to be like downtown and we're going to be like, you know, hopefully a great wine shop, but I think also too, it's just going to be a place for people to come and learn and, and have fun. Yeah. And you guys are, I think, uh, from what I saw, like you're going to rotate the selection pretty frequently. Like you're not going to have, right. Like you're not going to have anything just constantly like there, like you're going to kind of mix it up quite a bit, like you like to do. And and that way people can come in and there's always something kind of different for them to explore. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's, I, I think the concept of the shop too, you know, you mentioned like some of the emporiums in Cincinnati and I mean, Columbus used to have one of those. We had the Andersons, which was just a crazy amount of wine. I mean, think about like a grocery store aisle of wine. Well, they had like five or six long aisles of wine. It was a huge selection, but I think like, so we're basically the opposite of that. We're going to have maybe 250 different wines at any given time. So it's like, we're not going to have 200 different Cabernets. We're going to have like maybe 10 or 12 that we're really excited about. But so again, yeah, because I'm very ADD and there's always the next thing that I'm excited about. That's why we'll just keep rotating stuff out and be like, hey, if you really liked the one that you had last time, we can order it in for you. Otherwise, you should definitely try this new one we just found. Because that's, I mean, wine right now, it's it's never been a better time to be a wine drinker because much like craft beer, there's just so many great brands out there at this point. Do you think Columbus will ever wind up having another emporium like that? I mean, it you know, Cincinnati has Jungle Gyms, which if anybody's ever been there, it's just huge selection. I, I don't know what's up in Cleveland. You know, Nashville has Cork Dorks. Anderson's is, is closed for a couple years now. So given the size of Columbus and it's growing at this rapid pace, even though it's pretty spread out in terms of when you compare it to other major cities, it seems like there might be a potential for an emporium to come back in, but maybe it's also not beneficial for that just because of all the overhead with, you know, all the stock that they have to hold and everything like that. Is that anything that you're concerned about coming in, even though you guys have your own niche that you're going to be focusing on or, or do you feel based on the landscape, like chances are probably not going to happen anytime soon. So don't really need to worry about it too, too much. Well, Ohio is in a unique position. Um, this gets into some of the legal stuff that is floating in the background. That's actually, again, really beneficial to small wine shops. So in, a, in most industries around the country and actually um, in a lot of the states around the country for, for alcohol, uh, you can basically make deals. So if you're a big store and you're like, you know what, I'm going to buy five pallets of this wine and I want you to give me a better price. Uh, you can't do that in Ohio. So in Ohio, you the, like, everybody gets the same price. It's set for everyone. So it kind of levels the playing field a lot. That's why I don't think for a while we're going to get people like Total Wine. Um, it's probably not going to come into Ohio for a while because part of their business model is these large volume deals. So if they ever get the law changed, then we probably will see some big boxes come into the state. But barring that happening... I can't imagine getting any more big box stores just because and this goes into not just wine, but for everybody, uh, the internet versus brick and mortar is, is pretty competitive. So I know like wine.com is building a big warehouse in Columbus right now. And I think like, I think that will be your biggest competition is, you know, massive warehouses that don't have to look pretty because they can just have, you know, nobody's there. It's all feeding the internet. I think that's, the major competition of the future. So I think like big box stores of, of just a hundred thousand different labels of wine. I can't imagine that's going to come back um, mm-hmm. to Columbus. I think, I think the internet will kind of see to that. Is I didn't know about the wine.com building a warehouse. Is that because during the pandemic, they, I don't remember really what happened with, but there was that law that got put forth was basically going to limit online is mainly targeted at them. And I think Wink was the other one that they were basically trying to get. So people had to buy wine and, and stuff locally in Ohio instead of being able to deliver it from out of state. Is that a result of that? Yeah. So that law has always been on the books. Um, there's actually only 16 states that legally allow um, out of state retailers to sell to consumer. You can buy from wineries, like pretty much every state in the country allows that. But the retailer selling out, 
pretty much most states are protectionist against that. Now, in the early days of the internet, you know, wine.com and everybody else, I mean, nobody was stopping it. So everyone was buying from these online retailers. But yeah, you're right. So last year, the attorney general of Ohio decided to start cracking down on all of these internet companies selling to Ohio. And a big part of that is just because it's like, you know, follow the money. Everybody wants their tax money. So if wine.com isn't going to pay sales tax for all this wine shipping in, then the state of Ohio is going to step in. So to circumvent that, then wine.com is now building a big warehouse here in Columbus. So that way they can still sell to the state of Ohio because they'll have a local license. Right. Okay. With with Accent, are people going to be able to, you know, when they come in, if they're looking for something specific, but, you know, maybe you guys don't have it at that time or something, would they be able to order through you guys? Or is that, you know, because you were able to get your hands on on different things. I think you did like the Penfold wines and, and stuff like that. Um, or is that something where, well, no, we can't get that for you, but this is pretty close. Like we recommend you try try this. Yeah. I mean, it, we'll order anything that people ever asked for. I mean, I think that's part of the, like, we're very firmly uh, anti-snob. So like, you know what, like, you know, not to pick on a brand, but okay. Like Mayomi, like lots of people like Mayomi. I don't particularly like it. So it's probably not going to be on the shelf, but if people want to order it, I'm happy to, uh, to order it in for them. But I might have a conversation with like, Hey, you know what? Maybe you should try this really amazing Pinot Noir from Greg LaFollette from, uh, ancient Oak sellers or whatever the case might be with, you know, the COVID pandemic and everything. I mean, there was a spike in alcohol sales and, and cons- consumption of alcohol and everything. But with opening a, a wine store too as well, kind of as we near the end of it. But even with experts saying like there's potential for another one in, in five or 10 years, having the store kind of small, that allows you the flexibility to where if things are shut down again because another pandemic happens in a couple of years, you guys can pivot pretty easily to just, okay, we're back to the online delivery thing, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're not, and we're going to continue doing the online delivery, even when we first open. Um, I think, I don't think that's ever going away, but yeah, I mean, I think that's been a conversation of, of retailers for probably the last 10 years is, you know, uh, big square footage is expensive. I mean, that's, I think why, you know, like, clothing retailers are, are have been struggling for similar reasons. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the space is deliberately small, um, obviously for those logistical reasons, but also too, again, it gets back to, you know, we don't want to have like this sort of like overwhelming uh, sense of like too many items, which is good, keeps our inventory down. But I also would think that Wine is so intimidating. So how do we make wine less intimidating? So like I remember taking this trip to New York. Uh, we went to Terroir Wine Bar and the person I was with took one look at the wine list, which was like a thick booklet. And she said, you know, I don't even want to look at that. It's too too many choices. I don't know what I'm looking at. And so I was like, okay. So I, like consumers, I think, can feel the same way when they look at, you know, endless rows of wine. Um, with Columbus gets a smaller allocation of of wines, right? Because it's, you know, not as much competition here. It, it makes it easier to get them because even though maybe your winery allocates 12 bottles to Ohio, there's just not as many people trying to get those 12 bottles versus New York or San Francisco or, or wherever, bigger, bigger markets, bigger cities. Um, with COVID happening and a lot of wines that weren't, available a lot of them that kind of maybe went direct to restaurants but those were closed were you able to get anything that you were surprised that you were able to get during that time that like became available yeah i mean the um had we had huge allocations uh, like clo rajard where they're like hey um which is this really great um producer of cab franc from loire and 2014 was like the last vintage that they made before they sold so, yeah, like it's a wine you basically can't even find. And we were able to get six, six packs of it, which was huge. And then we got like, yeah, I mean, which is so many restaurants. There, there's a lot of wines that 
were typically soaked up by two and three Michelin star restaurants in New York. And because they were all closed, like we were able to, to buy a, a pretty healthy quantity of it. Do you think? So yeah, we were pretty well off on that. Well, do, do you think that that'll establish inroads to maybe increasing allocations? Like maybe you'll be able to get that stuff a little bit more frequently, or do you think it's going to go back to as soon as the two and three star Michelin restaurants open, like we're not going to see this stuff ever again? Um, I'm optimistic. I mean, that's to each importer what they want their business model to be. But um, I mean, I don't, I, I think it'll be a little bit more scarce, but hopefully, you know, those, those relationships um, uh, stay fruitful. Why? I, I like champagne. Uh, I'm a big fan of it, but there is this uh, apprehensiveness, I think, for people to try to, I think it's been, you know, labeled as a celebration beverage for so long. I mean, since, you know, over a hundred years, it's always been deemed this, you know, thing you're supposed to have at all these parties and galas and stuff and, and going way back when to the French aristocracy and all that stuff. But how, you know, they've done a great job with all that, but why do you think people are still so hesitant to try it, even with the influx of, you know, rosé all day and all that stuff that that's happened over the past couple of years? Well, I mean, I think it goes right to what you were saying. Like, you know, the the Champenois are sort of victims of their own marketing success. You know, they they were the ones that branded it as a celebratory beverage uh, for for decades, um, and so I think that's indelibly like been it's in the American consumer. Like, hey, this is this is the thing you have for a celebration. So now I think that, you know, people are trying, they're trying to backtrack it a little bit like, well, you know, like, you know, this is a really food friendly wine. And to be honest, it's probably the most food friendly wine made. Um, And so I think that's just part of that consumer education of like, you know, you can, you can have champagne with steak. It's delicious. Um, But I think that's just, yeah, I, I think that they're victims of their own marketing. And now it's time to try to show the world that. No, oh, actually, champagne can be drank all the time. And what are we celebrating? I don't know. It's Tuesday. Why not? So if you were running a champagne house then, because I think, you know, they should be leaning in towards, you know, if they want to keep the celebration stuff and everything, like they should be leaning in towards kind of the Instagram social media lifestyle that isn't accurate or authentic, but, you know, they could lean that way. What would you do, I guess, if you were running a champagne house marketing wise, like what? Well, I do think that, you know, if you're going to talk about like social media marketing, I mean, most social media marketing is probably you could boil it down to lifestyle. If you're going to talk about like the wine industry mostly goes towards lifestyle or brand image marketing. Um, So I don't know, like champagne has already, again, for so long been associated with with luxury um, and celebration. So I don't think you really have to change an image like that. What I would do again, like I get that champagne is expensive, like, you know, to, to the point of, you know, we were talking about earlier that, you know, most people are only going to spend a top of like $20 a bottle. So when you start talking about champagne, starting at like $45 a bottle, like champagne's expensive. But I think in the world in which we're talking about Napa Cabernet, like champagne is priced in that same way. Like I think that a lot of people do have this expectation that red wine is supposed to be more expensive than white or bubbles and is somehow more serious or more complicated. But I think that champagne can be every bit as complicated and compelling a beverage as anything. What I would do if I were a champagne house is I would have I don't know. I would post photographs of people drinking champagne on the couch in their pajamas, which is probably how most champagne was drunk in the last year because everyone was living in their house. Again, I think the point is that like, if, if, if you're the sort of person that thinks that on a Tuesday night, maybe you're just feeling a little bit, you want to really enjoy a Tuesday night steak dinner and you open up a bottle of Cabernet, there should be no reason that like that same argument can't be made for champagne on a Tuesday. Yeah. So if I were marketing the, the region, that's what I would do is make it feel more like a piece of home as opposed to a thing that only happens when you're wearing a tuxedo. Are you when you go out to dinner, are you able to enjoy a dinner like if it's more of a fine dining establishment? Like, 
And I mean, it, I guess it doesn't have to be, but when you go out to dinner, are you able to just kind of check out and enjoy the dinner? Or do you find yourself like, compu- like not compulsively, but checking the wine bottle list to see like, what does this restaurant have to see like if they have something that you don't or, or anything like that? Or is it just you're able to separate? Oh, man, that's a good question. And I'll back up a little bit, I guess, to back when I was working at Till. Because uh, I remember Mogdial, you know, it had those two, two James Beard nominations uh, when he was at Dragonfly. And so at that point, it was like we really wanted to to finally win one. And so I remember I would just like eat out at a ton of different restaurants and just always be so analytical. And it and so even today, like it's like super hard sometimes for me to to go to a fi- like a high end fine dining restaurant and not just analyze the experience. Not just the wine list, but like the food, the plating, the ambiance, the the style of service. What music are they playing? Um, and it was funny, actually. I think like Veritas was the first restaurant. Like I, I got to the point I was so burnt out. I was just like, I don't even want to eat at restaurants anymore. You know, I've seen behind the curtain. It's not fun. Um, but I think that actually I remember eating at Veritas. I think they had been open for like two months months in Delaware is when I first went. And I was like, it with the first course that came out, I'll still remember that. I'll never forget that dish. And it came out and I was just like, I felt like a kid again, like, holy shit, this is fun. And so, yeah, there are some restaurants that can kind of like make me feel that way. And I, and I really do try not to analyze restaurants when I go out. Um, but I mean, it, it does always happen. You're like, oh yeah. Like you can read a list and instantly be like, Wow, they're swinging for the fences or wow, this is really phoned in. But to that point, I mean, I, I usually know whether wine's a focus of a restaurant before I go there. And so it's just kind of like, like I already have a pretty good idea in my head of like what I'm going to drink before I go to a restaurant. Like, like if I was going to go down to Cincinnati and I ate at deer, I would totally order wine. Cause like that wine program is fire. Uh, but if I would, otherwise I might just get a cocktail because I don't drink a ton of wine when I go out. Because I think I'm basically tasting wine eight hours a day and you get tired of it. So I'm just like, you know what? A high life and a shot of Jameson sounds pretty good. Do you taste every day, basically? Uh, or is there a, did like, do you put in like, you know what? Like I've been tasting like for two weeks straight. Like I'm not doing that today. I just need a break. Like a. Yeah. So I was, uh, well, before COVID. Yeah. I mean, the reps would come in every day. Uh, unless I was like, you know what, I need to catch up on work. I'm not tasting today, but usually I was like, yeah, come on in. And then especially prepping for the exam, um, I, which I'm about to start back up on. Um, yeah, you blind taste every single day doing flights, which takes a lot of mental energy because it's hyper analytical. And, and I remember when I passed the advanced exam, I had been, you know, crushing wine flights every single day for like six months straight. And it just almost took the fun out of wine. (laughs) And so I had to like take two or three months off of wine to come back and be like, Oh yeah, this is a really delicious beverage. And it, I don't have to analyze everything that goes into my mouth. Um, so yeah, I mean now like there's less tasting now with, with COVID there's not as many reps running around. And so I don't taste as much. And so that's where I can actually and enjoy wine a little bit more often at the house and just sit back and, and enjoy a glass or two. So with starting back up kind of your prep and everything, I mean, there's, you have to go, are you still going to have to drive? I, I think it was, uh, you did the Psalm life podcast. Um, but you were talking about like, you had to drive like two hours to Cleveland to taste with guys and then drive like two hours to Cincinnati to taste. Cause there's not really, a whole lot of Psalms, at least at that time, I think when you're going through it, maybe the time before that were, that you were able to kind of link up with and do blind tastings. Has that changed? Are there more Psalms now in Ohio that you, that are closer or are you still going to have to make those long drives to, to link up with people? Uh, so there is a growing sommelier community in Columbus. It's been something I've been uh, sort of, as I have time trying to help grow um, a little bit and working with different tasting groups uh, in terms of people who are at my level, um, there's, there's not much in Columbus. I mean, there, it's me and Chris Dillman at the refectory. Um, 
and then uh, this kid, Jeff, who just moved up. But I think he's getting out of the Psalm game. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, to taste with people, I will have to travel. Although one of the really great things is, as we've, you know, with that 2020 pandemic word is pivot. Uh, uh, there there are some sommeliers now that basically we mail each other um, wine flights in like the little glass bottles. And so that's shrunk the world a lot. So, I mean, I've done a lot of, of those tastings over the last few months, or maybe I don't have to drive because they can, they can mail me stuff. Uh, but then otherwise, as far as like daily practice, yeah, I think it's just more of a sit there and grind it out by yourself and then t- yeah, take a drive to New York or something every once in a while and be like, make sure that you haven't like gone off the deep end. Do you think, um, with wine, do people buy the story or do people buy the wine itself? Like in your experience, do people, there's a majority of people are just like, I want something that tastes like this. Or do people gravitate towards like, I want something that has all this history and, and everything behind it. I think that, um, I mean, it's, it's both. I, I think that people are going to go in and they're like, you know what? Well, I want to experience I want a lighter red wine or I want a a champagne or I want a a richer Cabernet or something like that. And then after that, it's, yeah, this, it's mostly about the story. I mean, for anybody who's not locked in on a brand, like I have to have uh, my Camus. If if you're like, I want to like, tell me what you got, then the story is what's most important. And then after that, hopefully the, uh, the taste matches that um, desire and excitement. So, I mean, and and I guess that's how you end up like writing a wine list of wines that you're excited about is hopefully there's a lot of great stories to tell and hopefully the juice matches the story. With uh, the supper club menus, which out of those so far that they've done at Veritas, which was like your favorite in terms of, you know, creating the pairing list and the wine list? Because did you write or did you draw the French one by hand? I did. did you, okay, that's what I thought, and it's it was really I didn't get a picture of it unfortunately, but it was a really like I don't know it was it was really cool. Um, you know, I was really impressed by that. But but with with the supper clubs, like, was there one that you look back on so far and you're like, that I think is like the best job I did of pairing, or or one that's your favorite because of what you had in that pairing or anything like that? Um, well, I guess. In terms of like wines that I would be most excited to drink, I mean, the French menu, just because like I love French wines, but I would say probably the list that I was the most proud of was our first menu coming back from COVID. Um, We did a uh, Mexico supper club and um, because that one, it took a lot of work to wrap my brain around like how to pair wine with Mexican cuisine, which is... um, very heterogeneous. It's not mo- monolithic, right? Like you can't, there's so many different regional variations to Mexican cuisine. And, and I think it's one of the most complicated cuisines um, out there. And it's a lot of flavors that don't necessarily or immediately classically pair with wine, right? Like French wine and French and French food, like it's easy, right? Mm-hmm. There's all this history and you can kind of easily figure out like what works but there's not as much of that rich historical connotation association between Mexican cuisine and, and wine. And so that was a ton of fun to sort of, to work out for myself, the new rules of like what works and what doesn't work. Like in wine pairing classically, it's like, all right, well, if it has a lot of spicy heat, then you want to pair a wine with, uh, that has some residual sugar. Well, unless you're me, most people don't want to do like seven straight courses of sweet wines. So like, you know, basically just, uh, sitting down, uh, with, um, the, the, one of the, the former, um, cooks of Veritas opened this, um, this taco truck, which is actually dangerously close to my house. So I just remember one day I just like opened up a case of wine and ordered a ton of food from the taco truck and just sat there and experimented and sort of that whole just like marching into the unknown and relearning the rules of wine pairing. Like that was, I think, the most fun I've had in wine in a while. And that one I'm still pretty proud of. Yeah. Alex at uh, Alabrejas Food Truck. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Those are really good tacos that, that we've had. So, um, have you ever tried, so people keep asking me to, you know, out of the people that I know, I guess I'm maybe one of the more people that are into wine. So they keep asking me to try this 19 crimes Snoop Dogg wine. Have you had this or do you know anybody who has, is it garbage? Is it like, they keep saying like it's decent. And I'm like, there's no way that's decent. Uh, no, I haven't had it. Um, I'll never bad mouth a wine. Uh, like again, I like, will. <laughs> fair enough. I'm just happy people are drinking wine. Again, if we're going to talk to our previous conversation about market segments and and wine competing with beer, I'm glad that we're getting people who are wine drinkers. Would I ever go and buy a bottle of 19 Crimes? Probably not. But then again, it's not made for me. Right. It's, it's made for people who, like, I would imagine, having not had the wine, but I would imagine there's probably some residual sugar to the wine. It's very soft and mellow, um, which is a big market segment. And that's usually where a lot of people start into wine is soft, gently sweet wines. So is it made for me? No. Will I ever buy it? Probably not. Um, but I'm not going to begrudge somebody if they like it. So we got a few questions left. I'll ask these to all the Psalms. So it's a little bit different than, than what we ask um, the chefs. So there's a couple different ones in here. Who would you say so far is the biggest influence on your Psalm career? Chris Dillman. And he's over at the, the refractory, right? He's the uh, Psalm and beverage director, wine yeah. director. Yep. And that was, and, I, and I've told him this before, so I don't mind saying on the radio, but like, um, he was the, the Psalm that I think I looked up to and it really kind of inspired me to just keep pushing further. I mean, the guy is, um, is a master in every aspect except title. He's incredible. What is your desert island wine? So you get stuck on an island. You're only going to have one wine there for the rest of the time. You got water, all that other stuff. But what's the one? What's the one wine you're taking? Endless supply will be there, but only one <laughs> wine. Man, that's a really good question because like I have a lot of desert island wines. So um, I'll say. Um, so it was Jacques Salos Substance Champagne. That was, uh, I could drink that forever. Uh, what's the one restaurant in Columbus that you'd recommend that isn't, you know, your own? So not one that's within the Veritas family. So Veritas or 1808 or spec, but what's the one place other than that? You know, somebody's flying through, they get, you know, laid over at the, the airport. Like, uh, hey, I got to get something to eat. You guys aren't open. Where should I go? Oh, man. I, uh, I guess it depends on like what you want to go in for, but like Chew Thai is awesome. I love Chew Thai. Uh, Guilty Pleasure would be Club 185. I think they make the best burger in Columbus. And I am a vowed junk food fan. So those are pretty great. Um, and then uh, for a, like a high end, like a great restaurant, I'd probably go to Commune. I think that Joe Galetti does a really good job there. Um, bucket list travel destination, bucket list restaurant or winery uh in this case that you haven't been to that you want to go to uh i would just love yeah i would just love to travel again so like going to europe is pretty high on the list i mean i love spain but since i haven't been there yet and i really want to um i definitely want to go to to germany um i love riesling so to be able to go to the mosul i think would be pretty fantastic what's the craziest thing you've seen happen in a restaurant while you're working since you did work in restaurants, you do get this question. Oh, man. Um, well, I did set my own face on fire once. <laughs> How did you do that? Oh, uh, it was funny. Uh, so we had a uh, port tong service, which is sort of that, you know, um, take these tongs and get them red hot over a butane torch. And then you crack the neck of the bottle off. And so we were just starting to do that at, uh, at Veritas. And so we were going to do this service where you kind of like at 11 Madison park, you um, dip the glass into uh, wax. So you don't have a sharp piece of glass sitting on the table. Um, and my meltable wax had not come in yet. And so, uh, but I, there was a, there was a regular who I really wanted to do the service for. So I ended up getting this uh, tea light candle and put it in my little copper pan over the stove and like to, and like pre um, 
I didn't even take the, this is the dumb thing. I didn't even take the, the wax candle out of the little tin of the tea light. So I just put the tin tea light into this little copper pot, put it on the burner, and I wanted to pre-melt it before I got over to the table so it would be easier service. So I did that. So by the time it melted, I, I put my hand on the pot. It jiggled just a little bit, and the wax came out of the tin into the copper pot, instantly caught fire, giant fireball. And I, being an idiot, didn't even think about it being basically an oil fire and immediately blew on it like a candle to blow it out and just lit my face up, which is hilarious because the next day I had a photo shoot for um, Columbus Monthly's Tastemakers issue. So if you if you look closely in the in the photo, you can see some singed hairs on my beard. Yeah, when you, I mean, you guys also got... Uh... It was like wine enthusiasts, like top 100 uh, wine restaurants, right? We did. 2019. Yeah, it was uh, America's 100 best wine restaurants from wine enthusiasts. Did you know like that they were coming to like review or did they call you or how did all that go down? Yeah, um, it was kind of weird. Yeah, I don't know how we got on their radar. Um, but uh, so there had been a wine writer who came into wine or from wine enthusiasts came to Columbus, I think, at one point, And she had was writing this article about like, what does it mean to like vacation in Columbus? And so she ate at our place, but she also went to a bunch of other places. Uh, and then maybe like a month later, I got an email and they were like, would you mind sending us a copy of your wine list? So we mailed it in. And then a couple months after that, and they were like, well, congratulations. <laughs> it's kind of random. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, uh- Food or drink, guilty pleasure. I, I think probably drink is probably champagne, but but maybe not. But food wise, guilty pleasure. Well, well, I don't feel guilty about champagne. Fair enough. So, uh, yeah, going back to that, like I give me a cheeseburger and a and a high life, and I'm pretty happy. Pick one of the following ten. These are ten wine movies or, or documentaries. Pick which one that you think is the best that people should, if they were looking to get into wine. You know, you can go watch this. This will give you some. This is a good way to start. So we got Psalm, Psalm two, Psalm three, because there's three of those. Sour grapes, which is the one. Uh, it's on Netflix. The guy does all the counterfeit wine. Yeah, Rudy Cornillo one. <laughs> um, decanted, blood into wine, bottle shock, a good year, uncorked or sideways. Oh man. Um... I would say, and this is like what, to get somebody excited about wine or to start learning about yeah, wine? Yeah, like if somebody's like, oh, you know, I'm pretty interested. Like, I'd like to check out, you know, what is out there that I could watch about wine? And it's like, well, you got, you know, a handful of documentaries, but then there's also some some Hollywood movies. You know, which which out of those would you think is, you know, maybe the best for somebody to watch, but also keep in mind, you know, entertaining and, and all that stuff too. Like, which would you recommend? Um, I'd probably say Bottle Shock. Okay. Um, I mean, it's it's a fictionalized, you know, dramatization. You know, they've cut people out of history and that thing. But that was the whole point. Like, you're just like, hey, this is. I think it was a good Hollywood movie, and it's and it's about wine. Yeah, it was. Uh, they cut. They didn't even have. Um, what's his name from? Uh, Gergich. Or yeah, from Gergich. They didn't have Mike Gergich. Yeah, he wasn't in there at all. <laughs> it's like he's kind of. Kind of an important person to probably put in there, but um, why? So, give me three wine recommendations, right? So, twenty dollars and under for a bottle, twenty-one to ninety-nine dollars, and then over a hundred. What would you recommend somebody? Uh, well, I'll say that uh, you know the uh, the weather has changed, um, so I'm gonna pro- I'm gonna lean on like wines that I think are gonna be like really refreshing. So, um, Thibaud Bourguignon Rosé. Uh, I think it's, it's right around like 19, $20. Um, it's like my favorite rosé of the year. Uh, that wine is pretty on fire. Um, Cab Franc from the Loire Valley. Um, and what was the next one? Was it $50? Uh, yeah. I mean, 21 to 99, somewhere in that range. To 99. Um, man, there's a lot of good, good stuff. That, I, I think that's honestly like the sweet spot of wine is like under like 40 bucks. But so let's go with, um, We'll go with uh, Jolie Laid. Um, which one do I want to do from him? Actually, you know what? I'll do the Pax Hillsides Syrah is probably like one of the best wines I've had in the last year from Sonoma. 
and then over a hundred, like just kind of blowing out the budget. Uh, I mean, burgundy. So, um, yeah, any, any burgundy, let's go white burgundy. Um, I'll say some La Folatier Premier Cru, uh, Puini Monroche. Maybe some, like if you can get your hands on like Pierre Yves, Colin Murray, that would be great. But other, like anybody, like that vineyard's awesome. Uh, favorite, you know, Anthony Bourdain influence moment scene, or if you weren't an Anthony Bourdain fan, another culinary or wine personality um, that just kind of you always gravitated towards, you know, who was that and what is kind of your most memorable, you know, attribute or scene or anything from that they've done that always sticks with you? Um. I mean, I like Anthony Bourdain, although I didn't like, I don't really watch a lot of television. So um, I probably couldn't tell you, um, you know, like a great quote of his, um, but I, I really respect the hell out of what he did of, like, I really like his book, I think was, was the best thing. Um, you know, like, Hey, this is the underbelly. Like, this is, it's not a glorious job. It's a lot of hard work and blood and sweat. Um and I, so, I mean, I'll just stick with that. Just like what he did as far as, yeah, he kind of did the bad boy chef thing. But I think at the end of the day, the whole point is like that whole ethos exists because it's miserably hard work. Uh, where can people find you? Social media, website, all that stuff. Plug away. Uh, so my Instagram handle is uh, at cbussom, uh, C-B-U-S-S-O-M-M. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, you can find me, I'll, I'll be putting a lot of hours into accent, which hopefully will be opening here in June and, uh, I'll still be on the floor at Veritas. Cool. Well, yeah, um, that's it. I mean, like I said, I, I appreciate you coming on and being the first Psalm, you know, that we've been able to, to get and, um, yeah, definitely look forward to accent opening. I, I think it's going to be really cool from everything that's been posted with all the detail touches of the construction and everything. It looks like it's going to be a really awesome space. So definitely excited about that since it's kind of within walking distance too of, of where I live. Um, so that's a benefit for, for me, a selfish benefit, but yeah, any, uh, you know, anytime, you know, you want to come on, talk wine or, or, you know, if you like, I extend to all the chefs that come on too as well, you know, you guys wind up getting a whole bunch of new stuff in an accent. You want to come on and, and talk about it. Just hit me up, let me know. But, but otherwise, I'm sure we'll be seeing you soon uh, over at Veritas and eventually at Accent. Awesome. Thanks very much for having me. It was a lot of fun. That's it. That's the interview with Greg Stokes, the advanced sommelier over at Veritas and Accent Wine. Um, you can find him, like he said, on social media. So the Veritas 614 uh, Instagram handle as well. But you can also find him at CBUSSOM. Uh, so that is C-B-U-S-S-O-M. Uh, and at Accent Wine, which is going to be the wine shop that uh, him and Josh Dalton are opening up here. Um, set to open kind of in June, like he said. So keep an eye out for that. A couple articles floating around out there that he's done, too, with uh, local publications, too. So if you want a little bit more information, but I think we kind of covered everything that they would probably have in those articles. But big thanks again um, for coming on the podcast, uh, being the first to sommelier and, and coming on and talking wine with me and my limited knowledge of it compared to all these other sommeliers that I'm going to talk to over the course of like the next five weeks. So all those episodes will be coming out, but um, yeah, make sure you visit Accent once it opens. It's going to be a really cool concepts. So we're really excited for it. Just another avenue to be able to get like great wines and, and find stuff that you wouldn't regularly know about or anything like that, unless you were super into it. You know, Greg's kind of like a wine nerd, so it's awesome to have him and just these recommendations that you can get and and stuff like that too as well. Thanks again to also Andrew Herman, who is our editor, who's going to be editing uh, the podcast going forward. So um, shout out to him. You can find him on kind of all social media at track edit print. Um, so if you're looking for an editor or something like that, you know, um, for your podcast, if you're listening to this or, or what have you, um, he is out there and available. You can check out his work. Um, but big shout out to him for coming aboard and cleaning up, um, my amateur attempts at editing audio. So, uh, really happy to have him, uh, more stuff on the way too, as well. Like I said, we got a bunch of chefs and guest episodes lined up for everybody. We took a little break, a little vacation kind of there for the month of May. So kind of just thinking about big picture stuff and stuff we want to do and, 
and how we can make the user experience for the website, you know, more friendly and the listener experience, how we can improve that and make that better. So all the stuff that we're kind of focused on is just improving the quality and, and really kind of, you know, pushing to the next level um, with the podcast. The reception has been great so far. Um, so we really appreciate everybody that's been listening and helping spread the word, you know, through word of mouth and everything like that too, as well. So um, we're just going to continue to keep doing what we're doing, but just try and make it as, as good as possible for everybody uh, that's involved with, you know, listening and reading and you know, Instagram pictures and stuff like that. So um, yeah, just can't, can't thank everybody enough, you know, especially the guests, you know, that agree to come on. It's always kind of amazing. Some of the people that you're able to get on here, um, and it's just like they've never been asked or something to like do a podcast. It's really weird just because it's people that like, you know, you don't think you'd be able to get on. I never thought I'd, I'd be able to get anybody. Uh, and then you get Jay and, and then you get, you know, Jacob and Jacob leads to BJ and then BJ leads to Josh and Josh leads to Greg. And it's just it's really crazy how all that kind of just spider webs out. And everybody's, you know, pretty on board with sitting down or, or talking for an hour, hour and a half to to just the, somebody who's hosting a podcast. It, it kind of makes no sense, but it, it's still pretty awesome uh, in the same way. So um, make sure to check out all the previous Chefs and Guests episodes if there's something you haven't listened to in there. Uh, they're all up on the website at the Chefs and Guests. little drop down at the top. Uh, the website will be going through some minor changes. I'll detail those in another podcast. Uh, I'm just finishing up uh, kind of what I'm going to do with it. But definitely going to make the user friendly uh, or user experience more friendly. Um, but you can check out all the chefs and guest episodes. They're all in the feed. Um, it's all the same feed still. That's not going to get split up or anything. But links to them all on the website. Restaurant reviews. Those still come out every Monday. We've got a pretty big backlog of those. We're probably going to do like another Columbus restaurant week thing. So we'll just drop a bunch uh, throughout a week that are all focused on like different Columbus eateries. So there'll be a Veritas in there. There'll be a Chapman's, but um, there's some new stuff in there too. So it's not just retreads of, of stuff that uh, we've done previously thinking about maybe doing like a Cincinnati restaurant week too, as well. Uh, just got to get down there a couple more times to get a few, uh, a few other experiences. And then I think we would have enough to do that. Definitely going to do also like a Michelin starred week. So we got a little bit of a backlog of Michelin starred restaurants that we've been to. So um, we'll get those out to kind of all in the same week too, as well. So we all have stuff coming. I'm still doing the parts now known, you know, I know we've been on a little bit of a hiatus for a couple of weeks. I was on vacation and then we kind of did a vacation recap. So that's going to be, you know, that's, we're still finishing that. That's not going anywhere. That's still coming out on Wednesdays. Um, so we're still, you know, middle of season five right now. So we're still going to go all the way through the end. And then, um, I don't know what's to come after that. Once we finish it, that'll kind of probably run, I would imagine through, pretty much like the rest of the calendar year. And then um, we'll figure out kind of next steps on what we want to do. I got a couple ideas floating around, so got to get Ben's take on it and everything and, and see what he wants to do too as well. Um, and there might be some shifting, you know, I, I think eventually probably when we don't have like a chefs and guests episode scheduled for release, maybe that's where we put the restaurant reviews. So when we're on an off week with that, we'll put a restaurant review in there once we kind of get caught up with those. But uh, I have a pretty big backlog of those that have been recorded, so I want to make sure that we get those out there just because the first half of those episodes explain kind of the, the chef, all the research I did on the chef and everything, and then we kind of get into you know my experience there and, and the food and everything too. So I think those are pretty valuable for people as they start kind of getting back out there and traveling more um, and doing more traveling. Things open up with, you know, with COVID and they start going to different places. Once you figure out what restaurants are, are still around, um, if it is one that I've been to, you know, then you can listen to the podcast and kind of get a feel for the experience. And if it's some place that you want to go on that trip or, or maybe it's not something that fits kind of your style of eating and dining and, and you wind up going elsewhere and having a, a great experience over there. So that's kind of the, the aim with those is just to kind of give everybody a little bit of a broad overview of what to expect if you go to that place. Um, it, it, it's not foolproof. Doesn't mean that because I had a great experience, you're not going to have one or vice versa. Um, too as well. So it's not like letter of the law or anything. It's just suggestion. Uh, if you like to eat kind of the style of food that I like to eat, chef driven restaurants, a little bit elevated, um, locally sourced stuff. Um, this is kind of like the lane for you. So, um, but yeah, that's it for the podcast this week. So keep an eye on the feed, more stuff coming out, uh, in the next kind of month and two. So we're gonna, we're gonna flood your feed here. You know, we took a break, a little bit of a well-deserved break coming, you know, on a year, 
uh, we started podcast a year ago. So, you know, it was in June, uh, I think June 7th or 10th, uh, was the, the release date of the first, first restaurant review, first episode. Um, cause I banked like 10 of them and then I released them all at the same time. Probably was too many. Probably should have done five, but you live and you learn. So, um, like I said, appreciate everybody listening and, um, can't wait to get everything else out to you guys. Uh, really excited about everything we're doing. So we will talk to you guys next week.